Hi, I'm Marie Bliston, president of the New Jersey Education Association. The NJEA is committed to celebrating excellence in education. That's why we're so proud to support Teacher Appreciation Week, a special series produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating New Jersey's talented and dedicated teachers. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association. Seton Hall University, where leaders learn. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Hackensack Meridian Health. Wells Fargo. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. And by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And by Commerce Magazine. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, folks. I'm Steve Adubato, and it is my honor to introduce Mr. Stu Wexler, AP government and politics teacher at Heightstown High School. This is, in fact, part of our uh, series we're doing that really recognizes great teachers uh, in this state and in this region. Um, Classroom Close-Up is a series that uh, the NJEA does and airs on NJTV, and you're featured in that clip we're about to see, but, but I want to set it up here. Your class is in its third year of lobbying for a federal law called the Civil Rights Cold Case Act, which means what? So the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Act is modeled on the JFK Records Act, and the goal is to get the, mostly the Department of Justice to release the files on civil rights cold cases from 50, 60 years ago. What kind of cases are we talking about? Um, you'd be talking about cases that would be similar to like the Mississippi burning killings, but including cases like um, the Willie Edwards you killing. Mississippi burning, like church? Uh, Mississippi burning was the, the three civil rights workers who were killed in Freedom Shurner, Summer. You're talking about Scherner? Uh, Scherner, 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 Yeah, Cheney. And then, but it would also include the Birmingham bombing. Right. But even, but those cases actually were largely solved. These are cases like the murder of Willie Edwards in 1957, um, other cases that are similar where the cases actually were reopened closed, and this is in the last 10 years, with no resolution. So how are they closed if they're open? Well, they were reopened in, um, under the Emmett Till Act in 2007. By the way, people, do you think most people know who Emmett Till was? Uh, I don't think the mass majority of people know, even though What Emmett was his Till, crime? His crime was whistling or in the, wrong, in the direction a of a white woman. And for that? He was lynched and beaten and killed. What year? 1955, it would have been. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so they, in his name, they reopened a bunch of civil rights cases right. that followed and they closed them. Uh, the Department of Justice opened up 113, closed 113 without any resolution. And so the hope is, is if they can release the files mm. that everyday citizens, investigative journalists, historians, and maybe just as importantly, the family members sure. can at least get some answers, maybe not justice. That might be too, too late in some cases but at least they get to know something about what happened to their loved ones. Let's check out this video. It's some classroom close-up. It's a powerful story. We're still talking about issues of racial violence in our classrooms today. Maybe if we start talking about the stuff that still wasn't resolved from 50 years ago, we could start understanding why there's issues to this day. We never healed the original wounds in many cases. Partner up with somebody and update that person about where you are presently at trying to get representatives and lawmakers to meet with. Stuart Wexler and his AP government and politics class are three years into the process of getting a bill called the Civil Rights Cold Case Act made into law. We're the first high school class to ever write a law that I know of 
to actually get a bill introduced into the House of Representatives. Stewart's previous classes drafted the bill, and if it becomes law, will facilitate the release of documents in unsolved civil rights cases, like the Warless Jackson and Emmett Till murders. Warless Jackson is one of many cases. You have a person in Mississippi, activist in civil rights, he's killed. There's very strong suspicion if the Silver Dollar Group had something to do with it. They were a, sort of a violent offshoot of the Klan there. Warless Jackson was killed by a car bomb, and 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched for allegedly catcalling a white female store owner. Later, it was found out that it had actually not happened at all. She had not been catcalled, and this poor man was lynched for no reason. We feel like as if we provide context to our bill through use of Emmett Till, it would help us uh, push forward. The students contacted many representatives with the hopes of actually meeting with some of them during a class trip to Washington, D.C. in December of 2017. The goal was to gain as much support as possible for their bill. How many appointments do you have? Four. The act basically aims to give closure to the families and victims of civil rights cold cases, and it will establish a review board to oversee these files and hopefully get them released to the public eye. It's clear that Racism is still prevalent in society today, and we're still fighting for justice of these victims. And it's a question of humanity as a whole, that these people were humans, their own family members went through this, this deserves some sort of justice. It's a sense of security and relief to see that something's being done. If a high school class can do that, what could everyday Americans do? What can I do later on in my life? if I really feel that there's something that can be done to make something happen in the country. Extraordinary. What's this been like for you? It's been eye-opening. Um, first off, to see the students really dig into it and see something actually materialize. I didn't know if anything would materialize from something like this. I actually probably would have put my odds at pretty low when I started. And now I'm fairly optimistic that maybe we can actually get this through. Um, but I've also, you know, I've taught politics for a long time and followed it for even longer. And you learn things about the political process you never thought you'd learn. Like? Um, well, uh, in some ways, By having way, why a is this, Sorry for interrupting. As a former member of the state legislature in a different life, I used to be struck by how things got stuck, mm -hmm. important things. This is in committee, right? Yes. Why is it stuck? I would argue a couple of things. One, the committee's in flux, so they're already on their second chairman going out the door by November with Trey Gowdy. Uh, Chaffetz went out earlier in so the midterm. So Jason Chaffetz leaves. Yeah. Trey Gowdy on his way out. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there's instability in the committee, and, and therefore, what does that have to do with the agenda of what's Well, considered? part of it is, is that the committee is also going is one that's very heavily involved in some of the Trump yeah, investigation okay. type of so stuff So what happens well. to something like this, which is so long overdue? It's a no-brainer, but in many ways, I think sometimes that works against you. So in, in a controversial bill, it might motivate somebody who doesn't have a political cost to pay to take the side of a controversial bill that will never pass. Okay, so what do they say about this? They say stuff to us like, it's a no-brainer. But why uh, is it no-brainer not moving? I think it's no brain. Floor of the house. I think it's because that there, it's not something that r rates on their agenda the same way that tax reform rates on their agenda. You mean they don't get points for this? They don't get points for well, it. Well, think it's about what. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's it do for the students? I think a lot of them realize. I mean, I've been going to D.C. for years, but not necessarily with with the students, not necessarily for lobbying trips. And oddly, I think the lobbying trip invigorates them more than just going to D.C. regularly, doing a regular tour. I think once they get their feet wet in the political process and see they can make a difference, a lot of them say to me that that's what inspired them maybe to pursue political science and mm -hmm. public service after high school and in college. So I think they get quite a bit out of it, or at least I hope they do. Before I let you out here, what do you love about teaching? You know, I lo love interacting with the students and the light going on, and then maybe get your fangs into a few of them, and you changed our lives. So that's, that's always my hope. You frustrated for Layad here. You frustrated that we haven't made the progress. We obviously 
should be making in terms of racial justice and issues of racial violence? It's fascinating to me that the same issues keep on reoccurring. And again, I mean, I, I, I go back to what I said in, in, in that clip. In, in a way, if you haven't bothered to confront your own demons about it from 50, 60 years ago, why don't people understand the black experience with, with law enforcement or with violence? They, they haven't resolved yeah. that experience. They haven't resolved those issues for them from 50, 60 years ago. Keep doing important work. Thank you. Stuart, uh, Stu Wexler, AP government and politics teacher at Heightstown High School. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay right there. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to welcome Mark Packer, executive director of a terrific performing arts center called the South Orange Performing Arts Center, otherwise known as SOPA. SOPA. Describe it. I mean, I've been there. It's a great place in a great town. Tell us. Uh, SOPAC is a 439-seat theater. It also has a 2,000-square-foot loft space up on the third floor, mm. a towering atrium from an open lobby that goes all the way up to the top of the building, and on the second and third floors, there's a gallery space. Gorgeous. It is. Um, one of the things that's really special about SOPAC is that uh, the theater is incredibly intimate, uh, has superb sight lines, comfortable seating, and the acoust acoustics are just breathtaking. Mm. And so, you know, people who go and see a show there say that it's like sitting in their own living room and having right. the artists perform in front of them. Speaking of artists, um, one of the, one of the um, I, I don't know if you have them in order or not, but I, I had a great interview with uh, Bucky Pizzarelli and, and his son, John. John, these are two great, Jazz guitarist, which is talented. John, would you guys? Yes, John has performed at SOPAC several times, and we have him coming back next season. That's awesome. I love Who else? him. He's, he's, you know, he's an amazing raconteur as well he as a is. performer. He really is. Yeah. Uh, who else you have? Oh, um, this summer I have Mary Chapin Carpenter, who I'm really excited about. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of artists at SOPAC who generally Taj Mahal. play much larger venues. Taj Mahal, we've had. Um, Keb Mo? Keb Mo we've had, absolutely. And these are artists who I think enjoy the experience of performing in our space. They feel a connection to the audience and so they often request mm -hmm. to come back and play our venue. How difficult is it? Because I've been at, at uh, we've done some taping at another art center down the road from you, a little small place, you, you, you might know it. Uh, I often think, how competitive is it? <laughs> You got them over there, downtown in Brick City, Newark, right? Yeah. And you got you guys, and I'm thinking, you guys have great acts. They have good acts. How does that work? Well, you Are know, you all collaborative with each other? Actually, there's uh, an amazing spirit of collegiality really? among the nonprofit arts organizations. Absolutely. Because? It really is. It's stunning to me. I mean, I came to SOPAC five years ago, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be an island out there. Mm. Uh, and, and it's been the complete opposite. People were so gracious and helpful. And um, I don't feel that sense of competition. The reality is that you can't throw a rock without hitting a performing arts center That's up here. Right. There's so of, many. Yeah. So you really have to carve out a niche. You is that a good thing? Have... I'm sorry for interrupting. Is that a good thing for New Jersey? Have... Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes New Jersey culturally rich. It really does. It, it, it's all about the cultural fabric of our state. And so that we have all of these venues who are not only, you know, presenting great artists, but they're also actively engaged in arts education. That's right. You know, they're helping to, you know, foster the artists of tomorrow and the audiences for tomorrow. By the way, talk about uh, the connection to the South. South Orange is such a great town. Uh, the connection to the town and uh, I know Seton Hall University is yeah. part of the community as well and connected to you guys. Sure. So the village... Connection is really extraordinary. It's, that's the village of South Orange. The village of South Orange. Town. That's right. It's right. the, yes, the, yes. And that connection is really quite extraordinary because the village floated bonds to build SOPAC about 12 years ago. The, the, village the community? Did. The village The municipality? Did. Yes, it did. Wow. And the expectation at that time was that a nonprofit would be installed and their responsibility would be to pay back the principal and interest on the construction costs. And that never happened. Because? It just wasn't a viable model ever from the, from the, the get-go because the theater is not big enough to generate enough revenue 
to be able to repay that kind of debt. And so the village did something unprecedented. <clears throat> they transferred the debt off of our balance sheet. $15 million went away. What? And because of that, SOPAC was then unfettered to be able to go out and fundraise and to look like a much healthier organization. We became a tenant of the village. Right. They gave us a 50-year nominal lease for a dollar a year, which I prepaid. <laughs> and, Love it. You know, and we have this wonderful relationship with them. What about Seton Hall Connection? Well, Seton Hall was involved from the day the first uh, shovel went into the ground. They put a million dollars towards the construction of SOPAC. So um, they also became a tenant of ours. What and, do you mean a tenant? Well, they rent the facility from us for about 42 days out of the year, and they do student productions there. Um, Lionel Hampton? Lionel Hampton Band is somebody that they present that they have faculty concerts, and so they, you know, they will... What do you mean faculty concerts? They're faculty sponsored. They're artists that um, the arts faculty feel uh, would be beneficial for the community to have exposure to and for their students to have so exposure to. So they're arts... To program is tied to SOPAC. It is, and it's a great environment for their students, especially for their theater students, to do their productions mm. in a professional, state-of-the-art space. Love it. By the way, Georgia, we have a clip. What is it? It's called, I guess it's called, I don't guess, I know. It's called Playing Around South Orange. Let's take a look. Having these pianos around this town is cool because it gets to show kids talent, show you what kids really about. What were we just looking at? So when I came to SOPAC five years ago, I kind of challenged my staff to come up with a new way to engage the community so that people understood that we weren't going to stay confined to our footprint. That mm. We were going to be going out into the community and finding new ways to engage our residents and, and visitors to the town. And so the idea that we came up with was to uh, get pianos donated to uh, recruit artists who live in the community to actually right. paint the pianos as artwork. And then every fall, we surreptitiously go out into the community and these pianos appear for the enjoyment of the public to play. How great. So you're standing on the train platform and you're hearing somebody playing Bach you know, 20 feet away from Talk you. Talk about creative. Talk about, by the way, you're an entrepreneur, I could tell. <laughs> you're an arts entrepreneur. Well, I really, you know, I, I, I just felt that it was so important to sort of reboot SOPAC and find a new way for mm. the community to see the organization when I started. Doing good stuff. Thank you very much. Mark Packer, Executive Director of SOPAC, South Orange Performing Arts Center. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. All the best. Thanks for having <clears> me. <throat> right back, right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Ms. Uh, Ann Huntington. Vice President of Business Development for Huntington Learning Centers. Is it center or center? Center. But you have many centers, plural. We do. We How have many? 300 across the country. Started in 1977 by your parents. Yes. Ray and Eileen Huntington. Why did they do it? They saw a need. So my mother was a tenure teacher right near here in New Jersey. And she saw that students were missing skills. Mm -hmm. And my father, who has his PhD in statistics, so he saw the business angle of it. Right. And they started with one center in northern New Jersey. And Up now in Oradell, you said? In Oradell, New Jersey. And now we have 300 across the country. Did it grow very quickly? By the way, one of our children, my older son, went there for a couple of years. You have a, a location that happens to be in Verona, New Jersey, yes. close to where we live, so I know it well. Um, did it grow immediately? No, it grew. The reason why we're here today is because we focus on our mission, which is to give every student the best education possible. 
In order to do that, we have to focus on every single student. So we understand scale. We have 300 locations, but every location is successful because it focuses on that student. So it's steady growth. So break this down a little bit, because I remember what, what our son was learning at the time. It was mostly around math, but there's a lot of focus around quote unquote standardized testing, right? That includes, uh, well, there's the SAT, ACT, et cetera, et cetera, high school entrance exams, different tests. Is much of the focus around preparing for tests? So we need our students succeed, to succeed in sure. school, but there might be a gap that's missing. So to prepare for tomorrow's test, we're not going to get to the root of it in 24 hours. So that's where Huntington comes in, because we are, um, we're really good at what we do. We um, focus on the weaknesses of where the student's at academically, and we build up those skills. And by building up those skills, we build up the confidence and the mm. motivation for that student to succeed on that standardized Stay test. Stay on the whole question of confidence. I'm fascinated by this. And I, a kid, a teenager, who doesn't see him or herself as smart, keeps repeating that. I'm not smart, I'm not smart. And there are countless parents watching right now know what I'm talking about. What is it that you, the organization does for them, the centers do for them, to help that kid see that he or she is capable of more than what he or she believes or articulates, I know it's a complicated question, that he or she says they believe about themselves? Right. Sounds but, pretty deep, no? Yes, Steve, it is deep, but we're able to crack that because... What do you mean crack it? Well, to change a student from not making eye contact, not having uh, good self-esteem, having low self-esteem, and we change that to eye contact and confidence. And how we do that is we build up that student's skills, which then helps the confidence and the motivation. How we do it, our approach is diagnostic and prescriptive. So you may remember, remember with your child, right. this, your child came in for a test. That's right. That test is an academic evaluation. It's a battery of tests, and it can pinpoint exactly where the student is functioning academically, and then we build a program for the student. So customized? We will, it's all customized for every student. Um, so we can build up that confidence because we can go at the student's speed. Got it. We can build up and then we can go big steps and then little steps. Um, what's, it called? what's it called? Compensatory education services. It sounds pretty jargony. What is it? So within Huntington, we can help general education and special education students. One program that I rolled out is for uh, compensatory education. What does that mean, compensatory? It is, um, compensatory education is a fancy word or a fancy phrase for tutoring services. Got it. That every student in the United States is entitled to under federal law. Is that right? Yes. Ba based on the law? Yes. If a student is not receiving the services in school, the student can go uh, to a provider and receive those students, uh, receive those services? those services. Yes. And they pardon. report, they, they tell whom in order to, I'm not sure how that works. I mean. Right. So Huntington, as you know, Steve, we've been around 41 years. We value the Huntington homeschool connection. So we'll go to the school on behalf of the student to see how this, the student is performing in the school. So we will partner with the schools to make sure that the students are getting the services. Schools don't resist? You know, every we all have a common goal, and the common goal is our mission, which is to the give student. every student the best education right. possible. We focus on that student, and that's why we get the results we get. I mean, we get, on average, in 30 hours, 1.2 grade levels of growth in reading and one grade level mm. of growth in math. And then on that test prep side, ACT, 5.2 points in that same amount of time and 238 points in the same amount of time. Before I let you out of here, uh, you, big, big into the arts. Yes. Talk about it. The arts are a passion of mine, as is education, and I love it. I love education. I love art. What's the connection, education and the arts, in your mind? They're not married in terms of Huntington. Huntington, we're around 40-plus years later because we focus on the results and on those individualized programs. My passion also is art, and that's 
growing and conceiving and making ideas into reality, which I get to do every day at Huntington by growing programs mm -hmm. and helping students and impacting the future. Final question, how rewarding is it for you personally to see these students grow and reach their potential? Beyond, because we will change that student who doesn't make eye contact to then going into the center director's office and being best friends with that center director because he or she sees the results and can see that the potential can become a reality. And that's what I get that, to do. There's no, I mean, that kid, that boy or girl, takes, I, I don't even want to just say skills. I've got a few seconds here. It's, it's not, those aren't just skills. They take that sense of self for the rest of their lives. Yes, yes. And That's we can stuff. quantify it, too, with our results. Listen, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, Ann Huntington, Vice President of Business Development for Huntington Learning Center, established in 1977 as we're doing this program, 41 years later. I want to thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Steve. Well done. Thanks. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Seton Hall University, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Hackensack Meridian Health, Wells Fargo, MD Advantage, and by Choose New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. As one of America's premier Catholic universities, Seton Hall is a place where leaders learn to excel both in and out of the classroom, to explore new frontiers, to serve those in need, to succeed as champions, to achieve their dreams. Seton Hall University, where leaders learn.